So I have my volume up. Now I'm turning y'all's volume up. And we're going to... Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is. That THX noise. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That. Yeah, that. All right. You know, the sheet music for that was released not too long ago. I saw that on Facebook. <laughs> Just notes doing this. Yeah. Burp, burp, burp. All right. Greetings and salutations, travelers. Welcome back to the Interplanar Crossroads. Let's get through our announcements before anything else happens. We have our disclaimer. This is an adult podcast featuring adults that sometimes use adult language. You have been warned. Thanks, Dad. The Pathfather has spoken. Uh, Patreon goals for both uh, for the Interplanar Crossroads are $50 a month. We're going to give away a rule book. Once we hit $100 a month, we're going to give away a book we have on order, which is the special edition of the Pathfinder 2e playtest rulebook. Uh, so that will be cool. Also, we can't mention Patreon without also mentioning Black Dragon Gaming, who is running their Patreon right now. They've got a couple things going on. If they hit uh, like a hundred more dollars, I think it is, a month, they're going to run not just one group, but two groups through uh, the new Pathfinder 2nd Edition playtest module. So I don't need to sleep. We've got this. We've We're got in this. stretch goal territory already. Our little baby yeah. boy is growing up. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I actually did pick up another page from yesterday. So oh, there you go. There. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is, on this Around the Hearth, is the uh, Hail the Gauntlet blog post from Paizo, because we're covering second edition information and our opinions on it. And doing so, they released some information. They didn't do a Monday blog to go along with this one, so it's just going to be this one blog today, but they covered four different things in it, so we should have plenty to talk about for this coming hour. Um, uh, our next subscriber one-shot is going to be at 400 because we hit our 200 mark! Thanks to Black Dragon Gaming supporting us, as well as their Patreons, and those that participate in their games as well, as well as ones that we picked up just kind of going along, so... There we go. We've made it. Colin will be getting together. He was at a con earlier, so he's going to be getting home and getting together a uh, announcement recording for me to get up and edit about what he's going to be doing. You guys should love it. It should be fun. Even if you don't get to play, it'll be fun to watch. Uh, we won't. We'll do the announcement, and then we will announce. Uh, then we will let people uh, be selected after Sign we up. have that announcement up. So, uh, this month's giveaway, there's still a little time left to get in and get your chance to win a dice mug. Ba -da -ba -da. D20 dice mug. For your coffee, your tea, whatever you're looking for, I suppose. Whatever you consume, you may consume it in that beverage cup and feel privileged and truly, truly blessed. Because it's a D20. I don't know. The bourbon know. for the naturally successful. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, we're not going to announce anything else right now. Uh, when it gets to probably June, uh, first or second week in June, I'm going to put put together and put out a announcement on what we're going to be planning to do for our uh, Pathfinder playtest stuff and how to be involved in that. Uh, but other than that, I don't have any more announcements. And, oh, I had the five-minute mark right on. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I believe everyone has the, oh, the blog post up, correct? We we know what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so we'll yes, kind sir. of, we'll kind of take it as the blog post takes it. So, fighters. The, the fighter class has been previewed before, and... Uh, this one's been by Lo Louis Loza, and he wrote a little bit more about it, and it definitely has some stuff going on. Um, so, Tommy's probably got the most experience of reading this one because he had to, he already made a video on it. But, Tommy, we'll let you go ahead and start. And, and there's only three, there's only four of us total, so we can kind of pop in with our thoughts as we need to. I think. For sure. 
Well, the fighter, like, it really seems like the second edition fighter is going to be the class to play in second edition, at least in the playtest, because it's getting a lot of stuff that it needed to function, and they're borrowing a lot, like, <laughs> borrowing from third party, in and of the fact that, and Kane's going to cringe here, but the fighter is getting stances a la Path of War in second edition. Uh, they, does it say that they're getting stances? Like, they're getting stances. Because stances. Okay. Yes. It, yep. it, it, does, it does definitely seem like they're They've they've done a lot of work to kind of set them up like, like a like a Street Fighter style scenario where they can just still sort of power into combos where they set up this move which leads into this move which leads into this move. Hmm. Uh, but especially I like with, it. Yeah, well, because they they mentioned I do I do like it. Uh, they mentioned specifically in the blog post being able to set up like some sort of intimidating strike which leads into shatter defenses which leads into another move. I'm not sure what, but. Combat grab. You grab them with your free hand and stab them with your sword. Ooh. Right. Seems real good. But it's like, if you played Pathfinder 1st Edition, specifically if you played Path of War, you know that the stances, or even like in 3.5, the Tome of Battle with the Sword Sage Crusader, I think was one of them. And it, I just played the Sword Sage. I don't really remember. <laughs> the point is they're really powerful, and this will bring the fighter up onto the same level, if not higher than a lot of the classes like the one stance we've seen so far is you activate it as an open i believe is what they called it right yeah you activate it's an open ability and you have your shield raised for the duration of the fight you don't have to spend that one action to do this thing it's just there which is really really powerful because that frees up all three of your actions to bludgeon someone to death yeah but that's a good and stance you, Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> and you imagine there will be like stances that give you like bonuses to hit and things with your offhand. Like basically for every niche of the fighter, like the two-handed dude will have a thing, the archer fighter will probably have something, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And like Kane was saying, the street fighter aspect of it does feel really good to me because like in combat in a tabletop game, it's really easy to just kind of all right, I'm going to smack that dude. Do I hit that dude? Okay, here's some damage at that dude. Cam okay, done. With this, you're actively, like, you are participating all the time. You have to think about what's going on, so you're sequencing these moves, which is a really interesting take. I've never seen that before in an RPG. And it keeps you, like, on not your turn, you're sequencing one, two, three together, or, like, as the situation moves, you have to move three to two or two to, like, four turns from now or whatever that happens to be. And I definitely, like, I can sign off on that for sure because it keeps people attentive to the game and it keeps, like, it keeps combat fun and not just, like, I'm going to hit you. Yeah, you're not just, me. like, a back-and-forth throwing dice at each other competition. Yeah, for sure. And, I like, on that note, I also really like that it, it adds a certain uh, theatric element to martial combat that I feel doesn't necessarily exist in one edition, at least not in the same way. Uh, yeah because one of the big separating factors between marshals and um, magic casters is the ability to assign debuffs. There are ways for marshals to do it, but if they want to do it reliably, they usually have to focus into it really hard if they want to do it reliably or, or with any sort of variety. Because obviously in martial builds in first edition, you have like your enforcers you know, your enforcer builds that uh, non-lethal damage people into almost permanent shaking conditions. And then you have your, like, stacking multi-round debuff builds. But if you want... If you want to make a character that does that sort of thing, that's the only thing that character does well. Yeah. Um, in, yeah, that is accurate. To add, uh, uh, first edition was with the debuffs that martial classes get, you have to invest on average, two or more feats just to be efficient at that or to mm -hmm. do it very, very well, which is nice to have it change on the fly as uh, need be, as fighters just like the Panadin can change uh, their uh, bond uh, bonus that they get based upon what they're fighting. So that's nice. Yeah. Well, that is really cool. With the with sticking with the fighters for just a second when we <laughs> when we talk about stances and stuff i think didn't 4e do something similar to stances uh kane 
Yeah, with some of the classes, with some of your striker classes, um, actually, no, that's incorrect. It was mostly like your your controllers or uh, some of your defender characters. So that would be like your fighters, your summoners, your shamans, uh, people who were designed to manipulate the battlefield so that people could only go certain places or um, if they wanted to move the way that they wanted to move, they took penalties and yada, yada, yada. Hmm. Yeah, I, I like stances. I like the idea of stances. I like... Uh, the open hand, the the ability to use that secondary hand. If you're, like, if you're sacrificing not using a shield, you have an option now that is not going to be like, well, why aren't you using a shield? Well, because I'm focusing more right now on having that extra hand to be able to do an open hand ability of some kind. Um, and I I like that. I like the shielded strike type thing where you can you can keep that shield up if you're if you're building that way you can keep it up and you don't have to worry about it it's not going to influence your actions and stuff like that something that i'm up and down on is the division between actions that you're seeing with the fighter you got to watch if it's a fan attack if it's a press or if it's a press or if it's an open and I feel like with that, as well as the flexible feats that they start to get, you're getting a, a mini brawler, is what you're getting. That's what these feel like to me. Uh, second E fighters feel like brawlers. Uh, like a miniature version of them that is uh, kind of bite-sized. However, it concerns me a little bit because used to fighters were the class that you would say, oh, you're new? What do you want to play? They say, I don't know what I want to play. Well, why don't you play a fighter till you get the hang of it? Now, fighters are going to be doing a lot more. They're going to be, they're going to need to think about a lot more. So, I think every, I think everybody's going to be kind of simple at the front, easy to play at the front, and as you go up, it's going to get more and more complicated, which is only to be expected. Uh, so, I like what they're doing with the fighter. Uh, but I have a concern that it might be a little too, that it might become too squidgy, uh, to borrow Paizo's own term, if things <laughs> get, uh, if things get feet heavy or stuff like that. Um, well, I mean, you could almost make a similar argument for the the first edition Pathfinder fighter, if you want to go back farther to like the third edition or 3.5 edition fighter, like you're absolutely 1000% correct. The only thing a 3.5 fighter did was have a full base attack progression and get a feat every level. That was it. That was the whole class. Mm. And <clears throat> they were, they were really simple. And that was the class you would handle someone who had never played a tabletop before. And you didn't want them to have to deal with sorting through a spell book or, uh, writing down all of that initial sorcerer prep. Uh, but in first edition Pathfinder, you you see a bunch of different scaling bonuses that aren't necessarily as interesting as something you'd get off a of spellcaster. You do still definitely get the, like, at third level you have your scaling bravery, or if you're playing an archetype, whatever replaces your bravery, then... Uh, you have your armor training, which scales every level, unless you have something that replaces it, or your weapon training, which scales every five levels, or something else if you replaces it. Mm -hmm. Like, there are more numbers, there are more disparate, like, tracks of numbers to keep keep uh, to keep to in your head playing the Pathfinder fighter. Yeah. yeah, and there's definitely, towards the end of first edition, there's a lot of stuff come out for the first edition fighter that was really powerful, like... I think it's called effortless dual wielding is one of the advanced weapon trainings lets you yeah. knock down the, this category of a thing for like the purpose of what's in your offhand to say nothing of the war priest power. <laughs> I forget what probably it's called. Probably my favorite but... thing, Agunis, I think is the guy. It's probably my favorite thing that particular freelancer has ever written is the arm, the, his sections of the armor master and weapon master handbooks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But... You know, I like what they're doing with, with the fighter as far as giving them a lot of tactical stuff because I've always felt like fighters deserve to have that recognized. That, yeah, there are some fighters that are just bruiser, brawler type fighters, but there are some tacticians who know what to do in a battle specifically to affect their enemy. 
and I think that the second edition is going to allow to do that a lot more with stances and stuff like that. Um, let's move on. What's next? Clerics. Cleric domains of Mox Gauntlet. Now, we're really just focusing on the, I guess, the idea that they're presenting here with the different, uh, what are they, domains. That's what it is. And they feel pretty flavorful. Hey, Donald, what do you think of these domains? We'll let you start the cleric domain. I don't, I don't, don't domains, uh, uh, based upon which one you go with, they can offer a lot. Do you need domains for this uh, post? It is flavorful for what it does. It does what it does pretty good. Uh, if you like the wealth and using gold uh, as a yes, as a uh, as a uh, sub substitute, uh, mm -hmm. if you if you like something to cast the uh, cast the spell. So if you want to play a more of a finance, a more of a financial focused type of cleric like that, like an Abadar cleric, it suits them pretty, pretty well. Hmm. Which is, which is one thing I like clerics in second edition. You can easily flavor clerics bonus uh, spells based upon who they worship. Yeah. And it, the domains and the and the powers that they talk about are very very flavorful um it seems like they're putting a lot more like domains will be a lot more important in second edition than they were in first edition as at least how they felt in first edition there were clearly better domains than others in first edition and there will probably clear be clearly better domains in second edition that's just how the nature of things are depending on your your setup of the game that you're playing but it feels like if you choose a domain like secrecy or something like that i mean that's pretty powerful uh you're getting close to non-detection on certain things so that's pretty good yeah i will say that like clerics are good in first edition clerics are powerful but i never it never crossed my mind to play one in pathfinder first edition it's just not my jam in any way shape or form because they all kind of felt like like one cleric fits all it's you are this thing with these spells and here's a couple flavorful domains i guess some of them are right most I, of them you you're just going to be casting blessing of fervor or your cure spells or control water to, or what have to, you to, to add on to that clerics they're very versatile class for what you can make them you can make any type of cleric you want, but the only issue I have, and this is a personal gripe I have playing clerics, is generally when I do play clerics at times, I usually have to be forced into the heal bot role, which I don't like like clerics being forced to be mm -hmm. the quote unquote heal bot. I don't either, Donald, but we're level one and a house divided. You don't have true, a choice. True. We will die. True. But, we have but, to but, run to you and cry. Sinvolka has lay on hands now. You're not the only one I can help. I mean, this, 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 is MMO thing. this is more of a MMO thing to the to tabletop game is the heal bot role. I don't like forcing people to fill that role. Oh, I don't either. I definitely made a video on BDG way back in the day about, like, here are the spells your cleric should take. Being a healer is not your only thing. But as I said, in second edition, the clerics feel a lot more, like, flavor powerful. Like, if you're playing, for example, like a cleric of Norgaber can sneak right along with the rogues of Norgaber. The cleric of Arastal won't get lost in the woods as his rangers are hanging out in the woods, etc., 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 and the domain powers like we're taking away subdomains from what i understand of it and that's like i get why people are not cool with that but at the same time you get clerics that fit the niche instead of like all right you worship the god of this but you have nothing in your like right side of your sheet there's nothing at all that says you're good at this here's some spells though Right. Stay within one step of my alignment. I guess that's going to be a fun one too. Is how the alignment system for clerics and everything else is going to get radically thrown on its head. Yeah. In Pathfinder Second Edition, that's. It's, I don't think it's me. necessarily that radically different. It's definitely going to be more disparate, but it's. I don't. Is people love to argue about alignment because it's oh, they do. like, it's subjective morality. No one agrees on what subjective morality means because it's subjective morality. It's in the title. 
yeah. this just became an alignment discussion. Well, it's only su- yeah, it's only subject subjective if you have no objective references for your for the subjectivity, and you uh, but I you don't. do have objective. Uh, so, uh, Adam, yeah. I think one thing that is probably going to be be tossed out of play test potentially, it is a polar opposite alignment for the uh, deities when it comes to uh, PC options such as. Uh, 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 such as uh, uh, such as the Lamasju followers being chaotic evil, but worse, but choose to be choose to be chaotic evil characters following a lawful good god. That's right. going to be probably tossed out the window in playtest. Right, right. That's they've be talked. Real to... Weird. I don't know how that's going to work. Well, what they're what they're talking about, if I remember right, is not saying within one step, but rather giving each deity a, a set of alignments that can follow them. Like their own portfolio of behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So you may have, uh, you may have Saren Ray. She may allow, uh, not just neutral but lawful neutral. She may not. She may. She may allow. She don't. I don't know if she'll allow chaotic neutral. Cause it like, gets kind of. There are some odd chaotic. Chaotic neutral is probably the weirdest alignment to try and assign some kind of morality to. That because you know how you know that neutral evil is bad, and you know that neutral good is good. You you even know what to expect from chaotic good and chaotic new, uh, and chaotic evil. But when you hit chaotic neutral, it's like a ca- it seems to be a catch all alignment. For... Oh yeah, it is. It's definitely the catch-all alignment for I do what I want. But anyways, we were talking yeah. about clerics. <laughs> we were. <laughs> we did it. And we were talking about... I will about... say also that I think it's really cool that uh, a Lamashtin cleric can channel positive energy, not negative energy. It's not tied to the alignment. Now it's tied to deities specifically. Which makes more sense from a game perspective because if you're evil and you worship an evil god and your friends aren't undead... You're kind of a shitty cleric. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's accurate. There were in first edition that there were feats to convert the dam. What normal channel energy you would do to do one half of the opposite, but that is not not efficient. Yeah, it was just bad, and it took up resources. Yeah, yeah, it was really tough to to do it effectively and be a healer. You. You had to have positive energy magic going somewhere. Uh, yeah, until you got into, like, the upper levels and you could just prep, like, a heal or a heal mass real late game. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I hate to be that guy, but Baku has got to have the cure spells. It's yeah. like level five. What, 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 we need more We need more no, hit points. We need more defenses. He doesn't what, have to prep them. He can spontaneously cast them. What, 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 Is that what he chose? Yeah. Uh, clerics, uh, clerics, uh, you can convert uh, prepare 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 spells to heal. I yeah. am quite aware. I just like I know you're playing a neutral deity, so I didn't know if you chose uh, positive or negative. And I haven't seen you inflict any wounds though, so uh, I don't think you're playing a bad touch cleric. No, you no. Uh, I mean, just uh, just just looking at a pre entry, she. She is willing to allow a lot of things, but I'm just going off the book. But she is willing to not permit for the amount of spells I can use. That's yeah. fair. Well, Bri is very neutral, and she does lean. I would term her more lawful neutral, but like Ellen, yeah. yeah. But that's yeah, I that's am, me. Uh, anyway, I, I, yeah, I am. I, I am generally avoiding any create undead or any chaotic seem seem. Uh, magic, uh, magic, magic spells for automatically, and it's not for the game type. Yeah, no, this isn't. You're not playing Lucia. This isn't. Uh, this isn't. Lord <laughs> yeah, true, true. If some it's not good fest. Clockwork shit shows up. I'll just kill you. <laughs> clockwork <laughs> tea elementals. Anyway, clerics, second edition. That's what we're supposed to be talking about. Well, I think uh, I think it's really them. cool. I will say there's one power that's really great. And it's for wealth, and you wouldn't think it's that great. The advanced one, money talks. It sounds it sounds like you're playing a Ferengi, just straight up. But it lets you substitute coin currency for any sort of cost with a value measured in monetary value. They cite a vase worth 100 GP, but pff, no. What that is is if you don't have the diamond to res your dude, then you just set a thousand gold on his like forehead, and he's great. And I think that's aside really from strong. crushing never, his skull. Like, 
a thousand What's gold up? pieces. You stack he'll be fine. He's getting pieces. resurrected. It'll it'll fix it. It'll the magic. Nah, he's he'll, good. he'll be fine. It's, uh, what is it? Uh, it's ten gold pieces to a pound. It's only a hundred pounds of gold. Yeah, yeah he's literally getting a new body. It'll be great. It's only a hundred pounds of gold fine. sitting directly on that skull. Well, I'm not going to stack them a thousand high. <laughs> <laughs> on a noodle. <laughs> Uh, Tommy, I am. I'm picturing picturing now with the uh, amount of treasure that that dragon hordes usually get. They're the they're the they're the excuse to keep the uh, miscellaneous item that is worth 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 a lot just for the situation. Oh yeah, that painting worth a thousand gold now actually has a mechanical use in the game and not just I'm gonna take this to the nearest market. Right I'm gonna pick away. It up. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in my inventory. We're gonna run to the market and I'm gonna sell it because it's worth a whole lot more than everything you know, else we picked up. That actually does yep. remind me of what we're doing with uh, the ritual that Mazus bothered to learn. It's very much exchange oh, for exchange. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, well, I, now I'm, there's gonna be I'm a good girl for it. and a dog turn into a chimera on Rise of the Rune Lords. So I heard equivalent exchange, and I'm worried. No. Well, maybe finish watching Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I have. Just... It's great. It's wonderful. All right. Okay. Are we are we done with the cleric? I think rogues. so. Yes. Rogues. rogues. <laughs> All right. Kane, you're playing a rogue. You're playing two rogues. Tell us uh, about the rogue. I am playing rogue, but I didn't really read this part of the article because I was I was real excited about fighters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I. I I I also like uh, playing rogues as well. Rogues are uh, a lot of fun. I do like some of the stuff they have here going on, um, dirtling with the action economy. Uh, I feel like that's something rogues should be doing anyways. Like, even if they're taking penalties, um, I feel like rogues should be disturbing the rhythm that is inherent in combat because that that is advantageous to them is to uh, keep their opponents off beat, so to speak. Uh, because the more off balance your opponents are, the more your normally three-quarter base attack bonus, but it's, we're doing the proficiency thing now in second edition, mm -hmm. um, the better chance you're going to have as a non-traditional combatant to gain an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. The, um. With the uh, rogues, uh, uh, base with the good thing I like about them, how how they are they are made. As long as you use the feats uh, properly, you can make any type of rogue that 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 you want within reason to actually affect uh, combat a bit. Especially if you multi-class into a magic user class to get some of the very useful level one buffs and d d d d d buffs. If yeah, like an or like an arcane trickster vibe or something like that. I. Um, Pogue is actually the first fainting rogue I've ever seen. Same. I will say that in second edition, I didn't realize this until Adam was one of them. But there was a couple people on my on my second edition roundup video that commented, and they said that the rogue is getting a lot of the stuff that the ninja had in yeah. first edition. Now I played Which a ninja, good and because the base ninja is just better than the base rogue. Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> It's also like I always felt that uh, the ninja was really in the same with the samurai. They were just really forced. The classes aren't well. The ninja was good, but like, it should have been just an archetype. It should have just been oh, yeah. like some no, extra stuff. No, they were stuff definitely they just like a like a here's the oriental equivalent of the rogue and the cavalier. Enjoy, ta -da. yeah, pretty much. And it's the same way with the fighter and the brawler. I feel like doing this. It's the same with the rogue and the ninja. And I guess to like. Yeah. To jump the gun a little, the summoner and the wizard in and of the fact that every day your familiar has a pool of things that you can customize. We're not there to yet, Tommy. You want. We're not and there yet. I know, I'm jumping the gun a little, but it, it's relevant to this. I like that, I like having my choices in Pathfinder. I like that, like, I can build whatever the hell I want to do whatever the hell I want. But if I can do that with a smaller pool, but still have that same, like, mutability, then yeah. so much the better. Because it's like, that's why I like a Gestalt game. Because if I want to have my Eidolon plus my like Paladin stuff, I can do so. But now, like, I guess like I have actually though it was very illegal because you can't do it. I have played a Gestalt Rogue Ninja before. <laughs> but that's an alternate class. You can't do it. But I did it. And it was sweet. But now you don't have to because literally it's just the one class that's getting a lot of really really powerful stuff. Like they can turn 
so invisible that true seeing see invisibility glitter dust fairy fire can't pick them up they can they get essentially tremor sense slash scent in the they well, can pick just, up that's stuff. just hide in plain sight my dude yeah yeah real good hide in plain sight i do yeah. also like the like the ability to abuse the action economy getting that like you can take a neg one penalty, which is not even a penalty. That's just Ooh. minus one to take a five foot step and attack in one action and then have two more to ch -ch -ch again. It's really, really strong. I think rogues are going to be really, they're popular now, but now they're going to be popular and really viable in second edition. Well, to tie into that, from what I'm kind of sensing out, it seems like every class is going to be viable. Uh, because yeah, the marshals yeah. are um, getting stances, the the even the paladins with changes to them, the, which we'll get to in a minute. But it seems like everybody's going to be viable. The rogues, the like I said on your in a comment on your thing, like you said, like you pointed out, uh, brawlers are uh, fighters are mini brawlers. Uh, rogues are mini uh, mini ninjas, and then again. Following your lead to jump the gun, familiars are mini eidolons, uh, but the rogue's good, and I I've always liked the idea of getting to play a rogue, but have never played one specifically. And they've got power powerful disablers now. They got traps yeah. being optional, which is odd for a for the theme of a rogue, but it is also not odd when you consider that not all rogues want to be trap finders. Um, cause you... Yeah, I mean, if you were playing like a cat burglar who did like second story work or something, why does he need to know how to disable a guillotine trap? That's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Matter of fact, I think most of the archetypes, like most of the rogue archetypes in first edition would retrain like, not danger sense, but like uh, trap sense, I think is the name of it. Mm. Or like anything to redo or to deal with traps. Like I think scouts mess with it. Burglars, that's weird. Yeah. Not burglars, bandits, excuse me. Knife oh yeah, masters, bandits I get mess rid of them. But... Uh, Kane, is th this is uh, this is coming from a person who actually like uh, playing rogues. Just a single dip into fighter, or playing a class that get proficiency with uh, with uh, any type of martial weapon that you get to do dex damage and use dex to hit that is that's a great bonus for a rogue to have especially when it comes to second edition if they multi-class into fighter a bit yeah but i had considered multi-classing into fighter with magpie i had actually if um, my backup for magpie was to just take him straight fighter um far enough to get the the advanced weapon training that lets you finesse an entire weapon group <laughs> uh, and then I was gonna finesse like some big stupid weapon and and uh, 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 prestige into Shadow Dancer, anyways. Seems good. My huh. favorite uh, finesse uh, weapon it would be the Elven Curve Blade, just so for the strong. just for the damage and crit rate. Isn't it an exotic it's, weapon though? Yes, it's, an it's a racial. Yes, yeah. yeah, uh, um, if if well, I'm not an elf. If you, if, if oh, tankers get it too. They got sword trained. If, oh if, yeah, no, you're right. That's why I have the stock. If you ever play a tanku elf or any any race that, that get to use that weapon without needing to multi class or take a feat, it's a it's, it's, it is a great investment. We're gonna get that effort almost. Soon, we'll just be... like grab that like heirloom weapon pre rata. I'm playing an orc in Rise of the Rune Lords who uses an elven curve blade because it's it's that's how good they are. But on topic, I really like how second edition is like the weapons are automatically dexterity instead of strength if it is more in advantageous. Or the weapon qualities, so. the finesse and qualifiers, traits, and everything. yeah. You can't like you can't finesse the great axe, but if it has the finesse trait, it's already there. You aren't taxed to do so. Yeah, which is like that's a huge. Not it's a nice I compromise. Guess, but I really like it because that's why I house rule it in all my games if your weapon is finessable and it would be more advantageous for you to do so you have it there's no tax whatsoever well, and I feel like that's definitely that's a uh, an example of the the company listening to the community be like hey everybody uses this rule that isn't in the books because their rule is better than our rule maybe we should make that rule our rule yeah, yeah. so um, but to use a really just to like to back step for a half second here um to use a really nerdy term uh it feels like they're kind of remorting on a bunch of the classes 
because they had all of this expansion they did. They put out in additional books, especially the hybrid classes. And now that they have another shot at doing the bases again, this is the opportunity they're taking to be like, hey, this class kind of is supposed to replace this class in first edition. So instead, we're just going to take those two and just push them together. Take the best yeah. of ever. They of did each. say in, in the very first, like, Oh, no direction blog where Eric Mona and I can't think of the other guy's name when they Alexander were on no Guinness direction. And, uh, uh, that one, uh, yes. Two he others that, whose name is escaped me at the moment. <laughs> well, one of the guys said that there were a lot of, especially the hybrid classes that like could have been, should have been archetypes. In my personal opinion, I think like the war priest could have been an archetype. The investigator certainly could just be an alchemist archetype or maybe like a rogue archetype. And if we can, again, just do this, it's more like you'll get a chance to actually play these things and when you like as the years go on and oh now it's time to roll up another character i have a lot of characters and we all do on like myth weavers or google docs or oh good lord yes gathering dust that we'll never play but like i really want to play a brawler now just play a fighter uh ryan yeah. costello uh jefferson j thacka uh <laughs> well yeah those are the my... two main Okay. My final note for the rogue is that they finally... You can tell that they mixed them with the ninja because they get poison use for free and they get shadow clone jutsu. So, I mean... <laughs> there you go. Oh, they just couldn't let that go. Couldn't let it go. Uh, so paladins yeah, On now. that note, shadow clone jutsu is really good. I'll spoil a little bit for the first edition tournament. That the first episode should come up this week. Someone got paralyzed in the first round, had one round cast mirror image, had five total of him on the board as he went paralyzed. Literally, they hit every single mirror image before they got to this dude. I've never seen that before. It was nuts. Oh, I can get I can get around that. I digress. But, okay. Yeah, mirror image is like a real good spell. Yeah, um, it's, it's a good spell. Mirror, a, a mirror for for wizards. I find blur. Mirror, mirror image are usually a pretty good combo no oh, yeah no that's gross that's gross that Super. you would even bring those up together <laughs> yeah. oh you mean like uh, uh you the... mean like new like uh, not new but uh zanisha yeah zanisha yeah <laughs> we should have yeah no we should have done what i don't know i think it was tommy brought it up or it was one of the people in the discord brought it up uh that they had their paladin had gotten the permits to demolition that tower under the bridge stone ship it yeah yeah we should have just knocked that shit down like we had initially planned now i hope adam <laughs> would have had a contingency in mind for that as much as i'd have been really salty if nope that doesn't work haha ha, zanesha flies down in the taxi and kills your family haha ha. damn it there should have been a contingency for just like all right tag. fine she flies down and half the party deals with her while the other half knocks the tower down on top of her Fair enough. I wonder what I can do in Fort Rannick tomorrow with that then. Anyway. All right. Paladins. Right. Paladins. Second edition. Second edition Paladins got a little Spidey bit more information. Old. Yep. Um, so what I like, I've liked this about the Paladins since the first blog, is the fact that your allies are going to be, you know, you can invest in them a bit easier now to make them a lot more usable. You can get more than one. And... You could get all three if you wanted to. If you wanted to be geared out by your god, um, you could have blade, shield, and mount as followers. And I think it's interesting that they're going with the flavor, that it's not the weapon that is being enchanted or is being Im uh, improved, or the shield or the mount, that it's actually a spirit coming and inhabiting it. Uh, which <coughs> is Spiritualist. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh. It's it's different. It's not a uh, it's not like what we would have with paladins before. But it does make when you think about it a lot of sense for paladins to have that kind of sure. a boost instead of just a regular enchantment boost that comes from regular magic. They're more divine, so they would have that divine. Um, they're getting a lot of variety, a lot of variety straight out the gate, which is nice. I think all the classes are actually getting that. I. Th uh, one of the things we like best about Pathfinder 1E is that we get to build what we want to build for the most part. And uh, like we said pre-stream, Pathfinder's slogan should be, there's a feat for that. Because 
you can build almost anything that you want to do. May not always be viable, but you can build it in Pathfinder. Um, at least as far as fantasy goes, you just reflavor it for non-fantasy. But there, the spirit variety is going to be good because you can, especially when you start to homebrew and flavor that. Maybe it's the same spirit that comes again and again. Uh, that's a good way to flavor not just that, but summons and stuff like that. And you're getting stacking buffs and debuffs. Uh, and it seems like almost every... I think I think Pathfinder 2e GMs are going to have to be a bit on their game because all of their players are going to have debuffs almost. It, it depends on what classes they play, but it looks like almost every class is going to have the ability to debuff in some way or to buff in some way. Mm. So buffs and debuffs, there may be a game there that goes on in the meta, but it, it makes sense. It gives a lot of um, strength to every player. Every player, every PC has something they can contribute regardless of what situation they're in. There's going to be something they can do, which is important. And I think that that's, the, as far as the Paladin goes, I like the Paladins. Uh, it's my favorite class. I'm still a little concerned about how they're going to handle the naming of it. But anyway, that's that's how I feel about it. Um, what about you guys? I feel like Paladins, like, and this is coming from a guy in Pathfinder First Edition who will double dip Paladin on any character whose charisma is at least plus one just to grab Divine uh, favor and then be done with the class and that like that once a day smite evil is nice as well they kind of feel to me like uh oh like a diablo 2 paladin with the auras and stuff and the ability to influence your friends and give your friends stuff which is strong but i kind of feel like the paladin is getting a little bit of a nerf from first edition to second edition the smite evil is going to work a little differently about like Presently, I'm on the Paladin page of the blog because I need to remember how Retributive Strike reads. But I still think that word's weird. Like, Smite Evil getting changed around was sort of like Blade of Justice, I think it was. That feels weird. But uh, what I do like is that you can hand out Retributive Strike as a reaction, which allows you to counterattack and enfeeble any foe that hits one of your allies. You literally pass that out to the squad. So somebody gets hit and we're all playing like like five barbarians with the paladin who's the strike leader and he says okay guys hit him out and they go because they're barbarians and then they do the thing and that's really really powerful on the order of like how i thought swashbucklers worked before i understood what an immediate action was well so that i like a lot the auras feel really good as well again because it, it feels like a diablo 2 paladin and it kind of feels like we are taking a step into the realm of the like you need the classic party to survive and function in second edition because you can't just buy the wand of cure light wounds and hug it when you feel bad people are going to get hurt real easy fall damage is real monsters seem to be well the shadow has been nerfed which is probably for the best but like <laughs> it seems like the game is going to be a lot more brutal which i'm okay so, with like, like on that note it's like paladin was really strong before probably still is but it seems I guess I'm just a little salty that Divine Grace is now a reaction <laughs> instead of just I had this forever. Well, but I do get why that is one of the classes that needed to kind of do this to make a big flat to, to move forward. To clarify, you're saying that the retributive strike uh, is a reaction. Yeah, I went to the power one. That's a reaction that that if you try to use Divine Grace and you've already used your reaction, you can't use you can't. that. Yeah. Which means you're going to I have know, to be real, like real careful, um, uh, unless there's ways to get more reactions, which there probably I don't. Will be. I don't know if they're going to do the combat reflex thing or not. Um, it will be interesting to see because if they do, almost every class is going to need combat reflexes, because you sure. want extra reflex. Uh, you want extra things to do in between. Because uh, action economy is always going to be king, and if you can get more actions in the economy, there you go. 
The... Yeah. Any other opinions? The... No? Well, the one we... I don't have anything for the Paladin. Uh, I, um, I, I have nothing to say about the Paladin if I never played one. Oh, I see how it is. Yeah, I was going to say, do. despite the fact that I and Alex Borderline argued about the poison thing when they first made the Paladin block, I don't really play Paladins. I, I don't personally find them. They don't hold an interest for me, so... I can't speculate as to how powerful they they have been or are going to be, in, you know, going forward. So well, they have been. Uh, I, I can, uh, uh, from a uh, player's point of view, uh, Paladins, uh, looking at the changes that they that they made, they they are pretty pretty good and versatile. That's the only thing I can say about them. That's yeah. true. They they do feel. Um, maybe why I feel like they're different is they feel very, they feel kind of, they feel like a paladin, but they also feel kind of war priesty, you know? Yeah. So maybe they saw that. Perhaps even like the cavalier. Because yeah. They're handing out like teamwork feats when they're saying, everybody hit that guy. Yeah. So, uh, there's that. Uh, did anybody want to say anything about the gauntlet itself? An item 18. I assume that means item level 18. Uh, which... That do... worries me. I will say that. Yeah. Uh, I see item 18 and I think Starfinder and I think the paywall and the level wall that existed to get a hold of items in Starfinder. Yeah. I, I didn't like that in Starfinder. Um, if you're going to have prerequisites, I think you should have it in the flavor text of the item. Uh... Like a strength bow needs a certain amount of strength. You you go into the understanding of it when in Pathfinder One E. You know that if you want a composite long bow that's going to be able to do extra strength damage, you got to have a certain amount of strength. So it's you understand that going in. But all items to have all magic items to have an item level, I don't like that idea at all. Because um, I, I very much like the idea of what if a villager just found this gauntlet? What if it was cast into the world by Mox or whatever whatever deity this is supposed to be? Let me go back up. Mox from the yeah. Card Kingdom. It's a it's a it's yeah. not a magic reference, but Card Kingdom sells like magic cards and stuff like that. Yeah. So Mox... And probably also tabletop stuff. So Mox, it's it's cast forth from the vaults of Mox to be found by someone worthy again. And this villager just finds it. And this rando villager just finds it and puts it on and starts using it um, to cast 8th level Earthquake to intimidate those around him. Well, the PC's got to go and get that gauntlet now. One of the PCs is then found to be worthy. But if that's the case... That that type of really fun, just kind of flavorful things, not going to happen with an item level of eighteen being with an eight, the level of eighteen being required for that item. Um, so yeah, uh, looking at the price for what it does, that price is not very high at all for a magic item, especially being able to cast uh, eighth level earthquake. It's an. Well, I mean, they might also be reevaluating their the way currency distributes kind of like they do in 5th edition where everything is much less expensive because gold is worth more yeah I'm yeah. I wouldn't be upset if they went to the silver standard instead of the gold standard because I know that Pathfinder is supposed to function under the silver standard but it functions under the gold standard well it functions under like the class system basically <laughs> if you're not an adventurer everything is under the silver standard but if you're an adventurer, everything's under the gold standard. You want a loaf of bread? That'll be two gold. And get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> you're an adventurer? Actually, then you can pay adventurer only prices. <laughs> loaf of bread is only three coppers for Jim the Farmer. For you, you've got to pay your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an interesting way to, to tell the PCs how the surrounding um, populace feels about them. But um, something I do like is hey, that they is, know we're in a higher tax bracket than them. Yeah, something I do like is that the 
Gauntlet doesn't really talk about anything like it gives a plus whatever to your strength or blah 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 blah. It does say uh, when you invest the gauntlet, you either increase your strength uh, by two or increase it to 18, whichever would give you the higher score. Which is kind of weird to me um, that they would word it that way, but I guess it's okay. I know, I like it. I like that they word it that way because I feel like the the impression is supposed to be that the gauntlet makes you mighty but if you're already mighty it still makes you mighty just you know it doesn't do anything stupid <laughs> having having it worded like like that it gives the option of someone uh someone someone's strength score is high enough already it doesn't improve all that much but the one who have a let's say a strength of 12 that make a major difference uh, it's like in uh, first and second edition of D D, your strength modifier was using certain buff, uh, buff, 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 buff spells. It is eighteen max. You can get it without any other buffs. And then you yeah. have like I think fraction. there might also be like the, the sort of level, uh, or sorry, the ability score caps that you sort of see in fifth yeah. edition as well. But you can't get higher than. 20 without the aid of magic? Yeah, 20 without tomes. And then you can get it only like 22, I think, at the max. Right? But I could be wrong. I don't play 5B. Yeah, like I said, without the aid of magic items, I think you, most of your ability score is cap at 20. And I think we might see something similar in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And I'm not sure if that's just because they're simplifying the math down for 2nd Edition, um, which I'm all for. Um, that because simplifying the math down does not mean they're limiting custom ability, customizability, customizability. Just that, like, if the, that customizability is going to revolve more around abilities and conditions than it is going to revolve around. Here's your plus one, which stacks with this plus one that you got from this other thing that cost this much money. You know, right? Yeah. I also like how like we're seeing. Like it, there's a plus two or brings you to 18. And if we, I think we're gonna see that a lot on magic items and stuff. I, it'd be nice anyway to see it like uh, the headband of intelligence, which isn't like whether or not that exists. If there's an item that's like your intelligence goes up by two or increases to 18, and then grab an the barbarian, finds it and dons it, and then suddenly he's Einstein the barbarian. It helps again. It's like a balancing issue. Everybody can be good at everything. Professor it's Grog. Just a little bit of, a little bit of like poke. Professor yeah. Grog find this, and now he understands proper syntax. Adam knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, but I like that they're. I like that the gauntlets are focused, or at least the items, the magical items, seem to be focused more about flavor and less about just raw stat bonuses because that goes back to getting rid of the big six. Uh, that said, my only situation comes up with that strength of two, increased by two, or up to 18. If you have a, a, a 14 strength, or even a 12 strength as a rogue, and you slip on this gauntlet, all of the sudden, you're gonna, you want the gauntlet. The fighter doesn't need the gauntlet, does he? No, the fighter, who may be, I mean, conceptually it would seem like oh the gauntlet it would go to a fighter or a paladin or another martial class that is very strong well i don't know it it may create that weird thing where uh your suits don't your your armor set doesn't match but you're wearing it because it works type thing uh like you're like you see those memes and stuff so that's my <laughs> thing on that transmog but that's the gauntlet. Last thing we need to talk about is familiars. Opinions on familiars. Transmog, you're the real MVP. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure how I feel about the familiars yet. I, in first edition familiars, unless you're going for like the advanced uh, or the improved familiar route where you get like an imp or something else that has thumbs and you use it to cast spells, um, I familiars are there present you get a bonus that's neat i guess uh, if they deliver for, touch spells for, for the familiars based upon which one you go 
your uh, your fortitude for them vary based upon which one you go with. Strictly mechanically and what you can do with them. Yeah, and they, they talk yeah. a little bit here about um, you getting, like, how familiars are going to work now with your, your pool of points that you can use to customize your familiars. Because mm -hmm. in first edition, there's definitely, like, a small list of familiars that, because, you know, because they give you a typified bonus, dependent on what you pick, that are just better. Like, mm -hmm. it's really, like, having one of the birds that can speak a language is really good, because they can deliver messages for you. Um, the familiars that give you a bonuses to your saves are really good for obvious reasons. The initiative from the hare, or the, I yeah. think it's a compass, the green, or a green scorpion. Green scorpion. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah, or the little tiny dinosaur, you're correct. Uh, or um, if you're going for, I don't know if this still works in Pathfinder, but there definitely used to be a grappler wizard build um, that took an octopus as a familiar because it gave them a bonus on grapple checks. Seems good. <laughs> Dang it! I should have given Trox a. I should have given Zord a familiar. That would have been hilarious. You can take a feat. You can, you can obtain obtain familiar is still a feat. Somewhere. Oh, fair enough. I did not know that. Well, on but, the second edition familiars, I'll say that I like that uh, the blog was written by the guy who wrote the familiar folio, which has like the chosen one paladin, the I believe Leshy warden druid. Hold on, uh, I'll grab the book to get his name. The homunculist, I think homunculus is the uh, the alchemist archetype that literally gets a homunculus, and I like that. Like by that notion, the druid and the alchemist both will have access to familiars by taking feats. And I wonder if like because the the familiar is customizable a la the eidolon, like we mm -hmm. said. I wonder if like the leshy familiar like for flavor can like come out as like a bunny that speaks and also has wings. And also can deliver your touch spells and stuff. I think it's really cool. I I get why now, especially, that there's going to be a feat tax to grab that familiar. Not only because like it might not be somebody's jam, but also because it's essentially like picking up a baby Eidolon from Pathfinder First Edition. They get they get a lot of stuff. They get a swim speed. They can speak. They can fly. They can deliver touch spells again, which is probably the like best use for a familiar in combat is just like here's my shocking grasp it flies up and tags and then goes back i also like how they're using your ac instead of their own ac to calculate there's of course like for the gnome who can pick up a familiar with a feat no matter what he plays and then you have gnome fighter with plate mail and a shield how his pet monkey has a really high ac isn't like mentally translating both for me and Magically someone who commented on my post yeah pretty much i guess it's really good though and i also like they get four hit points per they're essentially a 3.5 wizard or sorcerer they four hit points per level mm -hmm. which is not much but it's more probably than the wizard with a like maybe it probably ends up being more than half of your hit points yeah yeah for sure so they're probably a little more, maybe not tanky, but they're probably a little more survivable. Yeah, they're a yeah. little less susceptible to uh, being volleyball spiked into the ground. Yeah, yeah. Good for um, 2018. Yeah. I haven't yeah. targeted the imp yet. Uh, no. the, 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 the one issue I have is familiars, Jenny. Go ahead, finish. Oh, uh, familiars, Jenny. Unless, it, unless if you say they are not in combat, they can die quickly. Well, well, they're so, in combat. They are like if you say your familiar is not in combat, unless you have a like portal to Elysium where you have jammed your familiar, that dude is on the board, mm -hmm. and you can be targeted. And I will target your imp if I need to, or the leshy. There's two people in Lord of the Caliber who have familiars. They're both with us right now. Well, the yeah. the, the good thing is, as long as my imp doesn't die outright, he, I don't need to worry about him dying due, due to fast heal. I do, yeah, do it's hope real good. I, 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 I do I do hope that the familiars gets access to some of the unique uh, abilities that some of the monsters do because fast heal too, it is fantastic for familiars to have, especially for combat ones. Yeah, yeah. that is definitely really good. Um, and just because we, we brought up these resources I feel maybe it's important to give a little lip service to the people who write these little uh, soft cover books 
for us. Uh, the authors for the familiar folio are Will McCardell, Philip Minchin, Mark Seifter, and Jerome Vinrick. There you go. Familiar folio is probably like my favorite of the Splat books again because like familiars are really strong in Pathfinder First Edition. Maybe not necessarily like go bunny rabbit, fight all of the goblins. I'll be over there. Have fun. You wouldn't unless it's yeah, like a mauler. Go up separately. <laughs> Even then, the Maulers, like, you don't get enough hit points, I don't think, on a Mauler familiar to be relevant past, like, fifth level, says Sir Aiden the Towering. Yeah, but nevertheless, that, that Guardian familiar, though. Mm. Yeah, those are good. I also like uh, uh, Emissaries. That's the one that can guidance at will. <laughs> Just leave him in your pocket, and he just pops out, and for you, my day! And there's um, your plus one. 800 hit point alchemist. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> You'll have to share that whole build with me at some point because this seems really good. Oh, sure, I'll just send it to you later. Mm. Fair uh, so, uh, some 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 of my favorite supplement books uh, are are written by people that don't have the recognition that they deserve. Uh, one of my favorite uh, writers for Paizo, it is by F. Uh, Redley Redley Snyder and the people who actually did. The did all the Book of the Dam uh, book series. So good. Yeah. So. Best best ever ever GM tool. Oh yeah. How many so obediences we can we jam in one book? Well, yeah. Book of the Dam. Book of the Dam. It is almost as big as uh, uh, as the advanced uh, uh, race race guide. Yeah, it's a humongous book. It's really good too. Yeah, another one I really like that doesn't get a lot of play just because. They're sort of like a, an, an eclectic part of Pathfinder's lore. Sometimes is the uh, the Path of the Hell Knight book that has mm -hmm. all the different orders in it and the, like lore about them. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, Hell Knights are fun. Well, I think we have successfully talked about this blog. Uh, my only statements about the familiars is that they are stronger. I understand that uh, I remember what I said when we talked about the wizards and how they weren't getting a, a familiar at first. It's the choice between a familiar or a um, bond the at bond. first. Um, from what I'm seeing, the arcane bond can be just as powerful as a as an eidolon, depending on how you use it. So I'd still like it if you could if you if there was something you could do to instead build into one or the other. Instead of having to take the feat just for the familiar, instead of you taking a feat to maybe improve the familiar if you wanted to, and so on and so forth. Similar to what's done in the other, in first edition, but that's just me. Um, I, uh, I'm s satisfied, I guess. It will depend on how the playtest goes, but I guess I'm satisfied with how they're going to work. But that said... That's fair. I think we've talked about everything. So, any statements, questions, comments, observations before we sign off, guys? I got uh, nothing. Give us more updates. What's wrong with you? Yeah, I'm, I've been refreshing the blog this whole uh, this whole conversation to see if they're going to put something out today. Well, it's the end of their con, also Memorial Day. Yeah. So yeah. probably not. But oh, the man get open. A man can make a smaller video about his own personal Pathfinder Second Edition predictions immediately after this. That's uh, probably uh, what's going to happen. Uh, so so far, uh, Second Edition playtests look quite uh, quite appealing, appealing appealing to uh, to, uh, to to actually play some of these uh, classes. Yeah, I'm very very like equally honored and excited to be able to like have the resources through the power of the internet to be able to host Doomsday Dawn on black dragon gaming it's also like i guess i'll commit to it here and now on the stream that it's going to be our debut on twitch as well because i need to like join the 21st century and learn how streaming works well but depends it's what you're streaming like, but there you go depends it's what your connection is like yeah hmm. so then maybe uh, maybe streaming uh, a house divide would be interested if you can actually get the views uh, for. Yeah. View. I, well, I feel I like if we were going to stream big... house divide, we should have started on the first one. Yeah, I think what the the big uh, the big deciding factor for whether or not streaming that is viable 
is if everyone you get who submits can commit to having a like a stable connection and b like not a terrible microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair enough. It does de- it, it does have a lot to do with your the success of it has a lot to do with the quality because you can't post edit the audio which even we uh kind of do. So yeah, and we get lucky because we have two. Technically, we have two recordings going at the same time. Because there are certain episodes we would have just lost all the audio on. Otherwise, yeah. All Fair right. Enough. So, thank you everyone for stopping by. Thank you, travelers, for returning to the Inn of Planar Crossroads. We hope you had a wonderful time with us. We had a wonderful time talking about this Pathfinder Second Edition stuff. So, as always, have a great day. God bless and enjoy. Bye. Bye. Uh, bye. I heard the uh, this time.